Amen, amen. Um, okay, so I, I know we've got several of you that haven't been here the last uh, few months with us, but for those of you that have, I just need to make a, a quick family statement to all of you. Um, the last two months of services here at Grace um, have been very interesting. God's called us to a lot. Um, it's been pretty common for me to walk up here and say, today's a special service. Um, you've heard that a lot, Yes. Um, and we've done a lot of special service things together. And I want to call that out uh, because that season has been precious. And the way that you guys have been responded, the way that you guys have responded has just been very important and very special. And so, like I said, I, I just want to take inventory real quick. Um, we started kind of in this place of saying God expects Jesus followers to actually follow Jesus. Amen. And you responded to that. Uh, and we, we talked about lukewarm faith and maybe starting strong, but having a season in your life where you fall away from God and the fact that we need to re come back and rededicate ourselves to God. And we asked you guys to take big steps and you were a people of courage and you took big steps. We talked about loving God for real, loving people for real giving it all to God because he is the owner of everything. It's one thing for him to be king. It's a different thing for him to be king of your life. And you guys took big steps and you walked in courage. And I want to call that out last week. Specifically, we talked about the people and the things that we have lost. And I saw maybe the most courage last week as you guys were willing to go there. Um, places of loss, places of pain. Um, not only did we go there, but then we took those cards at the end of last week and we cast our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. You surrendered those things to the Lord. And our prayer team met this last Thursday and took all of those cards that you guys filled out and prayed over all of those situations, prayed for you and for your healing. And they said, you know what? One week isn't enough. We're going to be praying all the month of December uh, for you guys and for your healing. Um, but I want to call out your courage. Um, it would be odd and wrong for me to say that I'm proud of you. Um, but I respect you. I respect this congregation, your courage and your obedience. Um, I love being part of this church. Love being part of this family. Amen? Amen. 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 So today is going to be a lighthearted message because you've earned it. <laughs> All right? Um, we're going to go over for the next several weeks the Christmas account, and I don't say the Christmas story, I say the Christmas account, because stories are things that we sometimes make up, yes? But historical accounts of real people that happened in real time and space, because that's what the biblical account is. Uh, we're going to talk about the account, amen? amen? And we're not going to shy away from all that God has for us. And so today is a simple Christmas account, and this one is unique. Um, this one's unique. The characters that we're about to talk about, you're not used to hearing about very often. They don't have their own Christmas songs. And the people in this one, they're not in your nativity sets, but they should be. Um, this is the person that very first in the book of Luke got visited by an angel and told that Jesus was about to be born. First one notified and they're not in your nativity set. Um, the reason I love this story and have come to love this story even more deeply is because this is one of the most human stories in the Christmas account. And I think you're gonna relate to it. This is Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we're gonna read all about them. So it's Luke chapter one, verse five. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. And he was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, if you remember. And all the people that were born after Aaron were part of the priesthood. Verse 6, Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. And they had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. So I'm going to dive into some of this detail. If you've been with us before, I think it's important to set on fire your imagination. I want you to see the people 
and the detail helps us to paint a picture up here, yes? And so you've got two characters here. You've got Elizabeth and you've got Zechariah and they're both from the priestly line. And so they're church staff, pastors, if you will. And it says that he is part of the division of Abijah. Why is that important? Because at this time in redemptive history, at the time Jesus was born, there were 20,000 priests working at that time in the temple. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that. And the division of Abijah was probably about 1,000 priests. And so what they did is they would rotate through those divisions. It was their turn the division of, of Abijah. It was their turn to be walk, working in the temple. Elizabeth, also from that priestly line, it says that both of them were righteous. Don't get hung up on that kind of phrasing. What the Bible is saying is not that they were perfect because no one is. Can I get an amen, second amen. service? Nobody is perfect. But the Bible will sometimes come in and say, this person walked in righteousness. And what it's trying to say is this person was especially faithful in their faith walk with Jesus. That's what it's trying to help us to understand. But they couldn't have kids. There's infertility there. And sometimes there's pain with that. Oftentimes there's pain with that. And some of you have felt that. This kind of story shows up many times in the Bible. This is almost like a greatest hit for God when it comes to human history. Because Abraham and Sarah could not have children either, if you remember that. And it wasn't until they were in uh, their advanced years that God comes and says, I'm going to do a miracle. And as older people, you're going to have a child anyway. And, and they had to believe that and walk in faith. And it was this massive thing. Hannah, Samuel's mother, was the same way. And there are other characters also that were beyond hope to have kids. And then God gave them kids anyway. Verse 8, one day Zechariah was serving God in the temple. For his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. And while the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. So out of the thousand of people in the division of Abijah, he was chosen by lot to be the one that had the great honor of burning incense in the temple that day. This may have been a once in a lifetime moment for Zechariah. Verse 11, while Zechariah was in that sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. He freaked out. Right? He freaked out. If you saw an angel, so would you. Right? Like he's just in there doing his job and he's excited. He's probably praying. This is a big moment. He's in a holy place, but he doesn't expect an angel to show up. And he's so freaked out. Why is he freaked out? Because the angel does not come chill. Like we don't know what the angel's doing or how it looks. Does he look like he's on fire? Does he look massively large? We don't know. But he is such a supernatural presence in the middle of that space that Zechariah is physically shaking and overwhelmed with fear. Verse 13, the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Thank you. God has heard your prayer. Now, if you're somebody who takes notes and you're reading in a physical Bible today, underline, God has heard your prayer. That is a fundamental phrase in the narrative today. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him John. So, so just real quick before we move on, God has heard your prayer. What prayer? He would probably prayed a lot of prayers the angels indicating it to him, you're going to have a son. So what's he saying? You've been praying for a long time, maybe decades, Zechariah, Elizabeth, you've been praying for a long time that you would have a child. God heard that prayer. You're about to have a child. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. If you're a Bible student, you're thinking Nazarite vow right now. That was something in the Old Testament. They would take a Nazarite vow where they wouldn't cut their hair. They wouldn't drink alcohol. Samson was supposed to be a Nazarite vow. He didn't keep it. You know the story of that. John is not supposed to drink alcohol. Verse 16, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah, and he will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. God has heard your prayer. 
One question I've got is, were they still praying for a child even though they were old? It doesn't say. Maybe they prayed decades ago and have stopped. Maybe they just prayed it that morning. Maybe he stopped praying and Elizabeth is still praying. We don't know. And the child's going to be John the Baptist who will prepare them for the coming of the Lord. That's the announcement of the Messiah. The Lord is coming. He's here. Like the Jews for 400 years had been praying for God to speak again. After Malachi, God had gone silent. The intertestamental period it is called. And, and, and they wanted God to speak. And the most, they wanted the Messiah to come. They knew the Messiah was to come. When's the Messiah going to come? He's telling them, it's now. You're going to live to see the Messiah. Amazing. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. So he says, I don't believe. Please give me some proof. I'd like that, please. The angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God, darn it. <laughs> Do you know who I am? Um, Gabriel, just so you get a sense of the gravitas of this situation. Gabriel is one of the two named angels in the scripture, Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel only appears by name um, three times that we know of in all of scripture. He appears to Daniel and he is named Gabriel. He appears to Zechariah. This is the second time. And he's about to appear to Mary. An angel appears to Joseph as well. It might be Gabriel. He's just not named there. But Gabriel doesn't show up a lot, right? Like this isn't a weekly occurrence for the people of God, for Gabriel to show up. It's a big deal. I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. So no talky talky for you for nine months. You didn't believe, you won't speak. You'll be silent. That's miracle number one. Miracle number two is you're going to get your voice back after nine months. Interesting. Verse 21. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. He must not have been very good at sign language, right? Wasn't even created at that time. So they're trying to figure out what in the world's going on. Okay. There are three scenes today I'm going to walk you through. That was scene one. But we got to ask a few questions of that scene. Question, why didn't he believe? Why didn't he believe? It's weird. Um, if this had been a play and he stepped on as an actor, he should have known what his next line was. When the angel said this is going to happen, and you just freaked out at the overwhelming supernatural evidence of this angel in front of you. You're also a priest, and you grew up in Sunday school with all the stories about this happening to other people. So when he says this to you, you believe it. Like, you know what you're supposed to do. What do I do next, angel? Let's go. That's what he should have done. I think about it, I think that's what I would have done. You should be laughing. Like, what, would I? Would you? I don't know. But he should have known. Like, even if he didn't mean it, he should have spoken words of belief to the angel because it's such an obvious moment. But he doesn't. So why? Why didn't he believe? How long had he been praying? When did he stop praying? When he stopped praying, what had happened to his faith in God as a whole? Like, we don't know. He's a very righteous man, but how tight was he with the father? I don't know. Did bitterness start to come in because he didn't get his answer to prayer? I don't know. There's a lot of questions here. But have you ever been in this situation before where you were in a situation and you spoke and later on you look back and you're like, why in the world did I say that? Like, I should have known what to say in that moment 
But there was something deeper in my heart that came out in that moment. And now I regret saying the thing. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he should have spoken words of belief, but they didn't come out even in the presence of an angel. What was deeper going on in his heart had significant doubt about the goodness and power of God come into the heart of Zechariah. Disappointment. Sometimes we pray for things and we don't get what we ask for. Sometimes we don't get the yes answer from God. We get the no answer from God. Anybody here ever get the no answer from God? Was that always a happy day for you? Me either. It's hard. And especially when it comes to, we want to have children. Uh, There's about a two-year period of time where Linda and I could not have children. And then Jake came along and we found the others to be easy. <laughs> Uh, but man, when you're going through that, it's painful. And so they're going through that and they're not getting the yes answer from God. And, 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 and I think some people could get the no and okay, this is not God's will for you to have children and I'm gonna bless you in other ways and this is my best for you. And, and you could receive that from God and your faith could be okay and you could stay close to God. And sometimes we can handle the no from God, but sometimes we can't. Sometimes we get the answer and it tweaks our soul like for real. And we go from disappointment in the answer to discouragement. And we go from discouragement to maybe bitterness and a deep-seated doubt toward God. And all of a sudden, Oh, we're not as close as what we used to be. And all of a sudden, we don't believe him the way that we used to be. I think this happens. Expectations, right? You start with expectation. Isn't expectation a weird thing? We expect all kinds of things, right? Like, all it takes is a weatherman to tell you it's going to be sunny today. And you expect it. And if it's cloudy, you're mad. Why are you mad at a cloudy day? Because he said it was going to be sunny. So then I expected. You do it with the GPS. GPS said, we'll be here by this time. And then all of a sudden there's like, you know, construction. Ah! What, like, why does it matter? Because I expected. You know, it's just, it's little things, right? But then it's the big things that we expect. It's like, why would we expect? Why would Zechariah and Elizabeth expect to have a kid? Because everybody else is having kids. And everybody else is experiencing this kind of family life. And that's painful. What are the other things that we expect? We expect not to hear the word cancer. Yeah? We expect the business that we started to succeed. We expect to not get divorced. We expect, we expect a lot of things. And when they don't happen and we pray and God doesn't give us the answer that we want, it's painful. And we go from expect to disappointed to discouraged to maybe a little bit bitter. You see how human our brother is here? He's pretty human. I love the Christmas story. But the Christmas story, most of the people in the nativity there, all of these people, like, I don't know, it's like they got smiles on their faces and they believe God and they do the right thing. And it's like, it, this is such a great little picture of, of people. Where's Zechariah at? Because I relate to that guy. Because sometimes I get derailed. I think we all get derailed in our faith. Hmm. Um, R.C. Sproul said, is one thing to believe in God is quite another to believe God. To believe God, to stay believing God for what he tells us. So Gabriel says, hey, Zechariah, we're going to put you on ice for nine months. No talking. You get to be silent. You get to sit on the sidelines, um, reevaluate things, but it's not permanent. God's going to give you your voice back after nine months. What in the world's going on there? Again, we don't know. Um, maybe the words that would have come out of his month, mouth for the next nine months would not have been good to the people that heard it. Maybe the words would have continued to be doubt and unbelief. Maybe it would have kept him in, in, in a dark place. I don't know. Maybe the, the, his inability to speak, maybe that he couldn't work his job. Maybe he had to go on a little uh, forced sabbatical. I went on a sabbatical this year. 
And I wasn't talking to many people at all except Linda. And it was good for me. That silence, that solitude, it rebuilt things in me. There's a part of me, it's like, what did nine months rebuild in our brother Zechariah? You're going to see at the very end because you're going to see the state of his heart when he gets his voice back and it's going to be changed. Next scene. This one is in Luke 139. And what happens in between here, I'm going to skip over some passages, but Mary gets her visit by the angel. She finds out she's going to get pregnant and that it's going to be Jesus. And, and it, it's an amazing thing. She does get pregnant. And, and when she does, she wants to go and celebrate it with Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife. Why? Because they're cousins. So there's a little fun fact in the Christmas story for you. Uh, Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. So Mary goes to visit her. Um, Pastor Tanner is going to preach about Mary and Joseph next week. But I'm just going to give you this tidbit because I think it's fun. Verse 39, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. And she entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, because she's, she's pregnant now with John, Elizabeth's child leapt within her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 44, when I heard your greeting, this is Elizabeth talking. She says, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed, Mary, because you believe what the Lord uh, said. Um, lots going on here. So first off, Elizabeth is pregnant. Mary comes to visit her and the baby inside of her is filled with the Holy Spirit and leaps for joy. Crazy. Reacts to the coming of Jesus who is in her womb, in Mary's womb, and leaps for joy. Crazy little moment. Um, I want to make this point. The word used for the baby in the womb there, it's a special Greek word. It means baby or toddler is the way that it's used. Um, so just to be clear, an unborn child that we would sometimes be tempted to call a fetus is called a baby slash toddler in this passage. And in this passage, that unborn child is treated like a person who is both filled with the Holy Spirit and responds with emotion, i.e. joy in that passage. That's not me entering anything into that in my own personal whatever. That's just there. When it comes to, when it comes to the personhood of the unborn, this passage right here is the clearest scriptural passage I know of that speaks about this. The second thing I want you to see is that she says, Mary, you're blessed because you believed what the Lord had to say to you. Now, because it's fun and comical, I imagine Zechariah sitting right there when she said it. <laughs> Unable to speak. <laughs> She's like, way to go, Mary. You actually believed. <laughs> I don't know if it happened like that but it's fun. Uh, what a statement though. Because Elizabeth by this point definitely knows what's up. Definitely knows why and what's going on. Okay, Zechariah's consequence here, nine months without speaking. Um, here's a question. Before we move to scene three, here's a question. Is it punishment from God? Because on the surface, that's how many of us read it. Is it punishment from God? Is God making him pay for what he's done? Is God angry with him? Okay, Hebrews 12.10. I just want you to see this. So the author of Hebrews talks about the, the um, discipline of God the Father toward us and explains the nuances of it. And these nuances and these motivations matter. Because if you're walking with God and God does things, sometimes we misunderstand his motives for what he does. So please dive into this. He says, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, that means in our childhood, doing the best that they knew how. So pause. That's him saying, I know you had earthly parents and they disciplined you, but they only did the best they knew how. What's he implying? He's implying they didn't do it right. He's implying they didn't do it perfectly. 
And you moms and dads out there, you're trying your best, amen? amen. You're trying your best. <laughs> but you're not as perfect as this, at this thing as God is. And that's what he's saying. Sometimes parents blow it. And I know I've spoken to some of you guys. We, we talk about God's such a good father and you should love God because he's such a good father. And you're like, but you should have met my father. And that's hard for me to believe in this good father because of the father that I was given on this earth. And that's, that's a journey for you to, to come to believe in a good father in your life. Respect that. But he draws a comparison here because sometimes our earthly parents, they punished us in anger, yes? They punished us in their lost temper, uh, their impatience. Sometimes they punished us cruelly or they overdid it. Sometimes our parents, when they punished us, they punished us because they believed we deserved it. It's not right. You even see this in our society, right? You broke this law. You're going to jail because you have a debt to pay to society. Do you know what that language is saying? That language is saying that there is something called cosmic justice. And when you offend justice, you owe the payment of a consequence in order to rebalance the scales of justice. Making sense? So we use that kind of phrasing. The problem is, is in the Christian world, that doesn't apply. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross for you, he satisfied cosmic justice for you. He satisfied all the needs of God's justice for every failure you've ever done in your entire life, past, present, and future. Jesus died for sin once for all. This is in, if you're taking notes, Hebrews 7, 27. I'm not gonna put it on the screens, but it says that when Jesus came to die for you, he died for sins once for all. For all. Now, what does that mean? If you look at the context of that passage really carefully, it is talking about the fact that all of your sins, all of your sins, you don't have to re-die for them over and over again. You don't have to re-suffer consequences for what you've done over and over again. Jesus paid for all of it. And he didn't just do that for you. He did it for every single person, past, present, and future. Once for all, say once for all. Once for all. So that means Zechariah was not being punished in order to pay and satisfy justice for the thing that he had done. Let's read the rest of Hebrews. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. Can I get an amen? amen. We don't like it. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So I'm going to give you the Greek here on that word discipline. It is paideia. Uh, paideia. And paideia means the emphasis is on to train or to teach. <clears throat> it's not just to dump wrath on because you deserve it. It's to train or it's to teach you. God brings discipline into our lives to teach us, to shape us but he does it out of a kind and loving heart. So years ago, I was a pastor at a church in Illinois. <clears throat> and while I was driving to that church, I might have broken speed laws, maybe. That was the allegation. I'll just say that. And a police car, traffic uh, car pulled me over. I mean, the lights and everything. And they stopped me on the street, right in front of the church building. It's the worst ever. You know, you have that moment where it's like you see the policeman pull in behind you and you're like, oh God, if you ever listen to me, please. And of course the lights come on and they stop you right there. And the whole church staff is at the front windows looking out. <laughs> It was not a great day, and it was not a great day for me, um, and it was not a warning. I got the ticket, for real. Um, I wish that had not happened, but the Lord decided that it was to happen, and I needed to receive that from his hand. Was it good for me? Yes, it was. 
If you'd have been able to track my speeding record, you would have known that was good for me. <laughs> I needed that accountability in my life. Um, we sometimes, we, we get mad at every consequence that comes to us. And we need to get better at receiving from God what he gives to us to change us, to train us up. Um, look at Peter for a second. Do you remember when Jesus walked on the water? I'm going to make this fast. Remember when Jesus walked on the water? And he could have just walked on the water. Peter wants to get out of the boat and walk on the water with him. How in the world does that even work? He's walking on water. Like what did God have to do in space and time in order to make that work? Did he adjust the gravitational pull of Peter's feet relative to planet earth? Like how did he do that? Did he change the density of the water underneath his feet so it was solid enough for him to be able to walk on? What in the world happened there scientifically, God? We don't know. We just know the miracle happened and Peter started walking on water. But if you know the rest of the story, Peter start, starts, starts taking his eyes off of Jesus for just a moment. And what happens? He starts to sink. So whatever God had done, God stopped doing. Why? Why? Is he punishing Peter because how dare he not believe? No. God comes into the situation and says, Peter, you're taking your eyes off of Jesus and I can see into your soul and I can see all the doubts that are coming in and I can see the fact that your faith right now is sinking and I'm going to make physical reality match spiritual reality. You're sinking on the inside. I'm just going to cause you to start sinking on the outside as well so that you know. And you know the grace of Jesus. Jesus is right there with a hand to pull him up and say, why did you doubt? Why'd you doubt, Peter? Because God expects Jesus' followers to follow Jesus. And he expects us to have faith in him. He expects us to walk in that for sure. But do you see the grace of God that showed him, showed Peter exactly what he needed? And that was not cosmic justice. Do you see that? Do you see that it was love? It's the same love that he shows to Zechariah here. The same exact kind of love. So scene three, verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son, just like the angel Gabriel had said. And then there's some stuff in the next verses about some people fight with her about what, they, what the baby should be called. She says, no, it's going to be called John because stinking Gabriel said so. And then verse 63, Zechariah motioned for a writing tablet and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John, wrote it on the tablet. Verse 64, instantly Zechariah could speak again and he began praising God. Just, just to summarize, so you've got the, the miracle of this baby being born. You've got the miracle of him losing his ability to speak. And now you've got the miracle of him getting his speech back. Verse 67. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. He hasn't spoken for nine months. He finally can talk. What's he going to say? Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago, just as he promised, just as he promised, just as he promised. The man who struggled in his faith is now saying God is faithful. When God says it, God will do it. What happened, Zechariah? Nine months happened. Nine months. How do you know that God's um, paideia was effective because when you pull the cake back out nine months later, it's good, yes? The faith is there. The faith is restored. You actually see it in his words. I love that. Verse 76, and you, my little son. So he's been talking about Jesus. And now he's going to switch over and start talking about his boy. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the most high because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. I just got a couple little things. So John, John the Baptist, right? He baptizes all these people. He's getting them ready for the coming of Jesus. It's this amazing thing. But he says the salvation is going to come through the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's big. Why? Because up to that point, the Jews would have said salvation is going to come through us keeping the law. Salvation is going to come through us finally getting perfect and faithful to Yahweh ourselves through our own power. He doesn't say that. He gets the gospel before Jesus is even here. 
He says, no, salvation is gonna come through the forgiveness of our sins because us broken people, we're gonna keep being broken people. And of course, Zechariah gets that. Because of God's tender mercy, verse 78, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. That's Jesus. To give light to those who are sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. He's gonna guide us to the path of peace. You got a lot of paths that you can walk in your life. Only one of them is God's path and his path is a path of peace. It is not a path of chaos. It is not a path of foolishness. It's a path of wisdom and truth. Amen? It's not a path of selfishness. It's a path where you finally get out of yourself and you begin to love God and love the other people around you. That's the path of Jesus. And he wants you to walk the path with him. Would you guys stand? I'm almost done. But the path is more. The path isn't perfect. The path leads us out of the disappointment that we're stuck in and out of the discouragement that we're stuck in. If any of you would want to get me a Christmas present, you could like maybe shape a little statue from my nativity scene and call it Zechariah. Because I need one. Because he's the human being in this story, yes? He's so solid because he's not solid. He's so real. I can relate. But I love the fact that God doesn't abandon him. You know what God should have said to the guy? He should have said, listen, this is Gabriel, okay? I got redemptive history going on. I do not have time for your nonsense, Zechariah. We're just gonna skip over you, find another family that will actually believe me. That would be the move. Or maybe like, I'll just skip over you. We'll give this to Elizabeth. She's a rock star, even though you got issues. She'll raise him. Doesn't do any of that. God goes in to not just work on redemptive history. He rescues Zechariah. He's got a plan for him. He's got a plan for all humanity, but he's got a plan for this guy. That should encourage you today. Have you ever been sidetracked in your faith? Has anything ever gone down to where you've started to doubt? And then you start to wonder, because of my doubt, can God ever use me again? Zechariah preaches a message to you today that God wants to redeem you. Amen? He's so good. Let's pray. God, you're so good. You're just so good. Thank you that you are big enough to be close to us as individuals. You don't treat us as a group. You know our hearts. You know the very number of hairs on our head. And you know exactly what we need from moment to moment. And God, there's people in this room and some of them just came to see a baptism and thank God for that. But God, there's some folks here listening to this today and they need your rescue, Lord. They've gotten stuck in their faith and Jesus, would you, would you come and resurrect faith in them? Jesus, would you come and bring them onto your path of peace also? Lord, we love you. In Christ's name, amen.